Hello, my name is Dan, and today I'm going to be introducing you to PyTigerGraph. PyTigerGraph is our answer to interfacing with TigerGraph solutions from Python. So first thing that we'll need in order to get started is a running TigerGraph solution. If you already have one, that's great. If not, I'll go through setting one up in TigerGraph Cloud, and we'll be using the recommendation engine, uh, movie recommendation starter kit as a way to get started. So if we hop into TigerGraph Cloud, we can just go to Create Solution. Um, we'll want to select our recommendation engine from here. Click Next. Um, I already have a free solution. You can only have one free solution per TigerGraph account. So I'm just going to pick a paid version. Um, but if you, you can select a free version, um, if you have one available, there's absolutely nothing that would prevent you from being able to do this demo on a free tier. So now we'll move on. Uh, we'll just need to name our solution something helpful. If demo should work for the password. I'm just going to set it as TigerGraph, uh, just so you guys can follow along easily with this demo. But please uh, set your own password, uh, something secure for your uh, user account. Our subdomain. And this is just how we'll reference our solution for when we're trying to connect to it. It's also where our solution will live. Uh, so we'll just set this to something that we can remember. And we can click Next. It's everything we need. We'll hit Submit. And there we go. So our solution is starting up. And we'll come back to it in a minute, so that way we can connect. All right, so it looks like our solution is ready. You can see that here. Um, we can visit it just to make sure. So if we click on this little icon here in the Select Graph Studio, that will take us over to Graph Studio. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Um, and we can see that we have our graph, my graph selected. And if we look at our schema, we can see that we have a schema defined. So we are all ready to start interfacing with our Tiger Graph Cloud solution. Um, so the first thing that we'll need in order to connect is a secret. The secret will allow us to submit our REST requests. And we'll just need to create a secret. Uh, we can either do that through the admin interface in Graph Studio. Um, so you could do that here just by creating a new secret. Or you can do it through PyTiger Graph itself. We'll start off by doing it through the admin portal. And then from there, I'll, later on, I'll show you how to do it uh, straight from within PyTiger Graph itself. So the first thing that we'll do is head over to our admin portal. We'll just call this demo secret, and we'll click plus to create our new secret. You'll need to copy this, as you will only see it once. If I were to refresh this page or come back to it, uh, that secret will no longer be visible to me. Um, so if I were to go here and then back to our page, we can now see that it's obstructed. Um, but I will need that secret for uh, later on. So first, let's get started by actually installing PyTigerGraph. This is just a standard pip install. Note that we have an exclamation mark here because we are doing this from within Google Colabs. If you're running this locally on your own machine, you do not need the exclamation mark before pip install. So let's just get that installed. They will also import it into our Python environment as well as uh, JSON and pandas, which are not necessary for PyTigerGraph, but we'll be using them within this demo. So it's, it's nice to have them imported. So there we go. Everything is imported, and we're ready to start working with PyTigerGraph. So the first thing that we'll need to do is set up our variables here for our environment. So this here is our domain name, which we set when creating, or our subdomain rather, that we set when creating our graph. And we can check this out just by going to uh, Graph Studio or user or the admin portal. Uh, but either way, you can go to your running graph instance and you can see its solution name up here. So we'll just copy this and we'll paste it in over um, our sample demo there, graph name. If we check our graph, our graph name is my graph, so we are all set there. And then the secret, we will want to paste in the secret, which I no longer have because I copied over it. So let me just generate another secret. My bad. And then we'll delete this old demo secret and we'll just create a new one with the same name. It doesn't matter. There we go. So we'll copy that and not copy anything in between this time. There's our secret. Our username is TigerGraph. And like I said earlier, our password is TigerGraph. So now we can set all those variables, and we're all set. So the next step is to make our actual graph connection uh, using PyTigerGraph. So we imported PyTigerGraph as TG. 
Uh, so we'll be using TG to establish a Tiger Graph connection with our host name, which is our subdomain, our graph name, and our uh, auth token, or auth secret. There we go. So this gives us our token. Uh, we're printing it out here. There's our token. We have it stored as our auth token variable. And now we're going to actually establish our connection. So we use that token in conjunction with our username and password. And there's our connection. And just to make sure that that actually works, we'll get the schema of our current graph. This will tell us what our schema looks like, as well as a bunch of other attributes of our graph. And there we go. So it looks like our connection is correct. And we can see that we have um, we have a person, we have a movie, and we have an edge connecting them called rate. So that's great. It looks like this graph, we are looking at ratings that people have made for movies. Now let's take a look at what we're actually getting for when we run that get schema command. So like I said, this is going to be the entire schema of our graph. If you don't know much about graph schema or graph modeling yet, I highly recommend you check out some of our intro to graph uh, tutorial videos just to get up to speed on sort of what graph is and what we're dealing with uh, in terms of a schema and what type of information that should hold. Uh, but we can see from our schema, uh, it prints back our graph name, my graph. That's good. We already knew that because we needed it to connect. And then uh, it will also list out our vertices as well as all of their attributes and a few other internal tiger graph um, stats about them. So we can see that we have one vertex type named person. It does not have any attributes, as we can see by this empty attribute list. We can see that it does have a primary ID of type string. And then we can also see that the primary ID attribute name is ID. It is not indexed. Um, it does not have any other internal attributes that it's linked to, and a few other just stats here. If we look back up at our actual output again, though, we can take a look at our movie vertex, and we can see that that does have attributes right here. So we can see that those attributes are both strings, and that one of our attributes is title, and the other one is genres. Uh, so that's how we read that. And then edges is very similar. Uh, we can see that we have one edge here, rate, um, that is coming from vertex type person and going to, oh, where is it here? To vertex type movie. So our person is rating or submitting a rating for our movie. And that this does have an attribute right here, two attributes actually. And those are type double and type date time. Our double is our rating and our date time is the time and date that this rating was actually submitted on. So that's a basic picture of what's in our graph and sort of how to read that schema output. Additionally, though, we can get some more information from our schema, or we can get it in an easier read format, I guess I should say. So here we can get our types of vertices and edges. So instead of having to read through that big output, we can just say uh, connection.getVertexTypes and it will print out our vertex types for us, the same with edges. We can also get some info about each of our vertices. So if we run this, we can see, much like we had before in our larger schema printout, we have just the information of a particular type of vertex. So here we are getting it just for the vertex type person and just for the edge type rate. So we can see our person attributes here, and well, rather our person information, there are no attributes, if you remember, and then our edge does have attributes. And then additionally, just diving into a little bit more info about our schema and the type of information that you can return. So for our edges, you can directly get the source and target vertex types for a particular edge, as well as whether or not it is directed. If it is directed, what the name of its reverse edge is. So if we just run this line here, we have a nice little print here, which will say that the edge rate is directed with the source type vertex person and a target vertex type movie. The reverse edge is reverse rate. So there we can get sort of all of our edge information in nice, easy to digest per attribute type information. So that's how we explore our schema. And next we'll look at how we actually look at the data itself rather than just the schema. Now that we've taken a look at our schema, let's take a look at the data that's actually in our graph. In order to do that, we'll create a helper function here called getLoadedStats. 
So this function will get our vertex count of both of our vertex types for person and movie, as well as get the count of edges uh, for our single edge type of rate. And we'll also get a selection of vertices of both person and movie. And it's important to note here that we have a limit placed on that call because as we start loading more and more data into that graph, this, ret this will return all of the data. So when we have tens of thousands of users loaded in, this would be a very crowded JSON message that we would get in return. So we're just limiting that. And then we have a few statements here to just print out the information that we've retrieved above. So we'll just run this to create our function. And then we'll also run our get loaded stats. And we can see that we currently do not have any data in our graph, zero people, zero movies, zero edges. So looks like we need to start loading some data. So there are a few different ways that we can load our data depending on what we're trying to do. So we have ways to load single data points at a time, whether that be a single vertex, a single edge. We also have ways to bulk load um, groups of vertices and edges. And finally, we have large options for importing entire CSVs or other data files. The first thing we'll do here is insert a single vertex. And it's important to note here that our function is called upsert vertex. So an upsert is a combination between an update and an insert meaning that if the vertex does not already exist in the graph, it will be created. And if that vertex does already exist, then it will be updated. So what do I mean does already exist and does not already exist? So if you'll remember earlier when we looked at our schema, each of our vertices had a unique ID. So if we look here, we can see we have a primary ID. Um, and for our movie, or for our person rather, which we're inserting, that primary ID is of type string. So there can only be one of that primary ID for a person vertex per graph. Let's take a look at what inserting a person looks like. Uh, so we have our upsert vertex function, once again, an upsert based off of our primary ID. So we have person here, which is our vertex type. And then we have that primary ID that we're going to give it. And since our person is a string, we'll just use that as name. And then finally, we have the attributes. If you recall from earlier, person does not have any attributes. So we're just going to give that an empty JSON object. And if we run the cell, we can see that we've returned a one. One means that one vertex was upserted. And since we're only upserting one vertex, that's what we're looking for. And now if we run our get loaded stats function again, we can see that we have one person currently loaded and that their VID is Dan. Awesome, cool. So that's a person, let's do a movie now. Movie will be slightly more complex, not much more, just because we have attributes. So you want to enter those attributes in a dictionary format within Python. So here we have our title as our key and the value is our movie here, Die Hard 4. Genres, uh, we have action. So we're going to make a call very similar to the last one with upsert vertex, type movie. The ID for the movies, since we have title as an attribute, the ID is more or less just a random number. So we'll just give this one the ID of one and our attributes will set to the attributes dictionary that we created on the last line. So we'll go ahead and create that. And we once again, get a one in return because we only created one vertex. And if we run our get loaded stats, we will see that we now have two vertices, one of type people, one of type movies, and here's all the associated information with each of those vertices. Finally, this wouldn't be a graph without edges. So let's get an edge loaded in here. Edge is going to be, it's upserting an edge is almost the same as upserting a vertex. Main thing to note here again is that it is an upsert. And we just have a few additional parameters that we have to specify for our function. So here we have upsert edge. It is going from a person and that person will be person ID Dan. Uh, the edge type is rate, and it is going to point to a movie with the vertex ID of one, because that's what we created earlier. And then those edge attributes will be the edge attributes that we've created up here with our rating. We have to remember that this is a double value and our rated at. So this is in a uh, date time format here. So now we can run this and we can see that we have loaded in one edge and once again, get loaded stats we will see that we have one vertex or two vertices of people, one person, one movie, and one edge connecting them. So there we go. That's one edge, one vertex. 
Um, so now we can take a look at loading in more than just one at a time, but still using the Python interface. Uh, we'll get to file loading in a minute. Here we'll just create a list of vertices that we want to load when we're loading in using these plural upsert functions. So upsert vertices and upsert edges. The format to note here is relatively similar to what we had when we were loading in a single vertex. So you'll note here that we have the primary ID and we have our list of attributes. Perhaps that's easier to show in movies, our primary ID and our list of attributes. But the one thing that we do not have in either of these lists is the type of vertex. And that is because for these upsert vertices functions, you can only insert or you can only upsert one type of vertex per uh, function call. So we define the vertex type when we make that function call and not per vertex within our list of vertices. Uh, so we can see here our edges also follow the same format as before. We have our beginning vertex ID, our ending vertex ID, and then any of the edge attributes and those vertex types for beginning and ending vertex will be specified in the actual call down here. So let's just create these lists so we can use them later. And then once again, like I said, upsert vertices, here's our vertex type, here's our list of people that we created, and the same so forth with movies and ratings. So we'll just run that. And we should see that three, so we had three of each person, movie and edge, and three of each of those were loaded. And once again, now our handy get stats function, we can see there is all of our data in the graph. So four people, four movies, and four edges. And here we can see the information about all of those vertices. Great, so the next step now is to explore our data a little bit more just before we get on to uh, bulk loading, because when we do bulk loading, we'll actually want to unload this data. Some of our more handy stats that we can use here, we have some get vertex stats functions, which will return some information about our vertices. Same with get edge stats. And we have some other stuff here as well. So I'll just run this and then I'll walk through the results as we go. All right, so what do these get stats functions do? So for any attributes of a particular vertex or edge that are numerical in nature, we can get statistics on them. So you'll note here that both person and movie returned back empty. And this is because all of their attributes are strings. Right, so if we go back up to our schema here and we reference um, our person, person has no attributes, so there's nothing we could sort by. And if we look at our movie here, we can see that each of our attributes are of type string. So there's not really any stats that we can do on those because they're not numbers. But if we do remember, um, our rating has both a double value as the actual rating and a date time value. Both of those are numerical values. So we can see here that we can get some stats on our edge values. So this is taking all of the edges of our graph into account. In our case, that's only four, but in a much larger graph, that could you know, be billions of edges. So we have an average rating of 8.45, a minimum rating of 7.3, and a max of 9.2. And then our date time here has been converted into epoch time. So if we were just go to, um, time converter and paste in uh, that date stamp. We can see that that corresponds to an actual date here, uh, January 8th, 2015, which I believe is one of the dates that we had specified um, 2015, January 8th uh, in one of our edges. So there we go there. Uh, that's just how those are going to print out, not necessarily in the same human readable date time format that they went into the graph. So there's some basic stats of all of our edges and vertices. And one more thing to note here is at any point with uh, where you're entering a type of vertex when retrieving stats, you cannot do this when loading in data, but when retrieving data, you can use the star wildcard operator here. So we are getting stats for all of our types of loaded vertices. And the thing here, the other flag that we can take a look at is skip NA. So as we saw here, both movie and person returned blank because they did not have any attributes that were applicable to uh, having numerical stats generated on them. So the skip NA basically just says, hey, if any of our vertices or edges have zero um, numerical attributes, then we do not need to, we can skip them. So 
this will print out an empty object because we are skipping both of our vertices because they don't have any attributes available for stats. That's really some of the helpful options that you can have there with these uh, get stats commands. Feel free to look at the documentation for some more information about them, but that's that's really the, the bulk of their functionality. Now that we've seen how to get overall stats for all given uh, loaded vertices of a certain type or edges of a certain type or just all vertices or all edges, let's take a look at how to get information on specific vertices or edges. We'll just run uh, this command here. So first thing we'll do is get a vertice by its ID. So that's once again, that primary ID. So if you remember, we loaded in that Dan vertex earlier. That will return any of the information about that particular vertex in the same format as we saw with our schema earlier. So we can see vertex ID is Dan, vertex type is person, and we do not have any attributes. We can also use this to get multiple of something at once. So in this command down here, we're going to get our vertices by ID again. This time we're going to get um, movies. And uh, instead of just inputting a single vertex ID, I've put in a list with two vertex IDs in it. And we'll see that that returns back information about those movies. So movie number two, ID two rather, is Inception. And movie ID four is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And here we have their given attributes for each one of those movies. Let's see. So we can do the same thing with edges. And there's a couple different ways to get edges. The first is get edge count from. To note here, this is just count. So this will only return the count of edges. But the from aspect here signifies that we're getting it from a specific vertex. So in this case, we are going from vertex of type person with the primary ID of Nick. And we'll just run this really quickly so I can go through the results at the same time. Here we can see we have two edges connected to our Nick vertex. So Nick has rated two movies. We can also specify the edge type and our target vertex type. For this particular graph, this isn't going to help us too much since we only have one edge type, which only leads to one target vertex type. But if you had a much more complicated graph, a fully connected graph, then uh, you could use this function just to limit the edges or the vertex types that you are traversing. One thing to note here, this is the count. And for each one of those counts, we have something that also is an identical function, but returns the actual edges themselves. So here we can see we have our get edges function. Once again, coming out of a uh, person type or a person type vertex with the primary ID of Nick. And here we can see, once again, from our earlier, we have two edges coming out of Nick. And here we have printed those two edges. So we can see that he's rated movie ID three and movie ID four. And we can see those given ratings and the time that they were rated at. Uh, it also includes some other information about the edge from type and uh, to type. So if you did have a more complicated graph, you would be able to more easily keep track of those edges in the results of that query. So that's really it for exploring the data that we currently have loaded in our graph. Like I said, I want to get to loading uh, bulk data. But before I do that, I want to remove sort of this dummy data that I've loaded in for the purpose of this tutorial. Uh, let's go through how we delete our data. First thing we'll want to do is actually see what we have, um, make sure we still have data. So there we go. Four people, four movies, four edges, just like we created earlier. And there's all of their attributes. Let's look at how we delete a single vertex. So we'll delete our person named Lena here. This is much like our other vertex commands. We specify the vertex type and we specify the primary ID. Delete vertex by ID. We'll run that. And just like our load commands, we get a result of one telling us that it has deleted one vertex. So here's another thing to note here. You can use, there is a permanent flag that you can use with this command. Permanent equals true. Uh, so what this would do, if you do not specify permanent, this does not mean that your data is not deleted from the graph. It is still deleted. What that permanent flag does is makes it so that you cannot load in another piece of data with that primary ID into your graph again until the schema is reset. By keeping this false, it still deletes our data. And if we wanted to, we could go rerun our function that loaded the data and we would load in our Lena primary ID for a person without an issue. If we had that permanent flag set, then we would not be allowed to load another person type vertex with the primary ID of Lena. So that's just something to keep note of there in case you are wondering what that is for. So now let's move on to uh, deleting multiple things at once. This is once again, very similar to our multiple upsert functions, just with deletes this time. 
We're also going to use this as an opportunity to do a little bit of logic uh, when we're deleting our things. We don't just have to run uh, these commands completely blindly. Uh, so we're just deleting and adding things willy nilly. We can take a little bit of logic into account. And there's some functions here that'll help us do that as well. We'll just run this quickly and then I'll run through it and talk about the results. So the first thing that we're going to do is get edge stats on our rate edge. So the main thing that we're, we wanna do here is delete any rating that is less than 9.0. First thing we need to do is obviously get our ratings, read their stats, and then through there, filter out anything that has a rating less than 9.0. We'll print out our stats here so we can see that we have four rate edges. The max rating is 9.2, the minimum is 7.3, and the average is 8.45. We're going to delete most of our edges. It looks like there's really only one edge, maybe two, that are greater than 9.0. And one of the cool things that we can do here is with these delete edges functions, with these delete vertex functions, um, any of these functions that kind of select more than one of any given type of thing, we can include a where clause. Where clauses are just like where clauses in the actual GSQL code themselves. You can familiarize yourself with those where clauses a little bit through our documentation. We have that linked up here where sort and limit are all the functions available to you through any of these multiple edge or multiple vertex types functions. Uh, but basically we say we wanna delete edges coming from type person, coming from person Nick, and those edge types are rate, and we want to take any of them where the rating is less than 9.0. Yeah, so we can see that we've deleted one edge. So now if we run our stats again, we can see that our average rating has gone down because we've deleted one edge with a rating below 9.0. And we can see that it was not our minimum or our maximum. Uh, so if we were to look at our data from before, we could see exactly what edge that was we deleted. So we can see that that was the rating from Nick to movie number three, a uh, rating of 8.7 stars. So that's how to selectively delete ver uh, edges. You can do the same thing with vertices using those where, limit, and sort clauses. So the thing to note here when running this is that we only deleted edges coming from person Nick. So this delete edges function requires a starting vertex. And for our purpose of wanting to delete all ratings less than 9.0, that, you know, as we can see here, we still have an average rating and minimum ratings that are less than 9.0. So we didn't do what we wanted to do because we were only able to start from one person. So let's look at a programmatic way which we can go about uh, deleting all of our ratings less than 9.0. So the first thing we'll want to do is get all of our rate edges. So we'll just select all of our rate edges and then we're going to use a Python for loop uh, to just sort of loop over those edges. And then we'll look at each edge and we'll see if its attribute rating is less than 9.0. And if it is, then we are going to delete that rating. Um, so right here, I'm just collecting the rating and the from person using our um, edge from ID. We could also use our connection to get the from vertex of our edge, uh, but it's easier since we already have our edge selected here to just get that attribute from it as a um, JSON object. So then we're going to delete our edges. So if we run this, we will see let me just give it a sec. And we'll see that it prints out a rating. Um, it'll print out the edges that it's deleted as well as what their rating was and who they were coming from. The first edge that we delete is a rating 7.3. That was our minimum. Another one is 8.6. Uh, that is definitely less than 9.0. And here are the people who made those ratings. So now we can see afterwards, we only have one rating edge left. That rating edge has a rating of 9.2, which will then be our maximum, minimum, and average because it is our only one. Just all we did here was programmatically go through all of our edges, check them to see if their attribute rating was less than 9.0. And if it was, then we deleted that edge by using uh, the information that we extracted from it, primarily that from ID and the type person. There we have it. That's how to programmatically navigate edges or vertices that are returned by uh, PyTigerGraph, get edges or get vertices functions, and then how to use the attributes of those as logic within Python. So here we're just going to delete all of our vertices and all of our movies from our graph. 
So if we run that, we can see that we've deleted three people in four movies. Um, we can remember we deleted Lena earlier, so we only had three people left in our graph, even though we had four movies. And if we run this again, we can see that we should probably still, yep, zero people, zero movies. And because there are no people or movies, any edges that would have been connecting them were removed. So there we go. We've now cleared out our graph. It's empty, back to our starting state. And we'll move on now to bulk data upsertion. We have a couple different options for bulk data upsertion. There is JSON loading via PyTiger graph, and then there is running of actual loading jobs. So the first thing we'll look at is uploading JSON uh, via upsert data. Uh, so we'll take a look at how that looks. So your JSON data will need to be in the Tiger graph uh, JSON format. So that will include, that will be a big JSON structure, including one key for vertices and one key for edges. And then within uh, each of those sections, you will have an entry for each one of your vertices and edges. So let's take a look at what our sample looks like. So here we can see we're loading in two people, Dan and Ben. These are our vertices type person. And then here we have two movies that we are loading in. Uh, we're loading in up and red line as one and two. And then from here, we can see that we have edges. The edges are broken out by their origin vertex type. So we can see that the ones that start at person are here. This one starts at Dan. It is a rating type edge. We are rating a movie. This is the movie ID. And then here are our attributes, our uh, rating and our rated at. We have another edge here. And the same with our Ben um, vertex. He is also rated uh, our two movies. So what we've created here are two people, Ben and Dan, two movies, uh, one and two, and four edges, uh, two ratings from each individual. So we'll just run this, and we'll see that we've accepted four vertices and four edges. So those have been loaded into the graph. And if we wanted to, we could take a look at those with our um, get loaded stats. And perfect. So there we can see our people and our movies that are loaded. Being able to load from JSON and our other methods are extremely helpful um, for smaller use cases. But when you're really trying to load in a lot of data, loading jobs are really your best way to go. So the first thing that we can take a look at for our loading jobs is what they are. Because we're using one of the sample graphs through TigerGraph Cloud, our graph already has loading jobs loaded onto it, even if there is no data loaded into the graph. Uh, we can see that if we go into the load data tab or even the map data tab within uh, Graph Studio, we can see that here we have a movies.csv and a ratings.csv. And if we look here, we can see that they are already mapped and our load section has, has that set up as well. So we could either run these through here by clicking this play button to start and resume loading, or we can do it directly through PyTiger Graph, which is what I'll be showing you today. So the first thing that we want to do is make sure that our graph is set to the current graph that we're using. If you just want to make sure that you have your graph selected, otherwise it will tell you that um, there are no jobs uh, loaded onto your machine. So we'll just run this. Um, so we're running a gsql command here uh, for both of these. GSQL is the Tiger Graph querying language, and through PyTiger Graph, you can just directly run a GSQL command should you wish. So pretty much anything you can do through GSQL, you can do through PyTiger Graph. So anyway, here's the results of showing our jobs. So we can see that we have two loading jobs. Uh, these will correspond to our movies and our people, um, but we can see that we have one uh, for ratings and one for movies. So rather, instead of having people, the people will be populated from the from attribute of the ratings. So either way, those are our two loading jobs. Now let's take a look at how to load some data in them. The first thing that we'll want to look at is loading from data currently on our Tiger Graph box itself. Like I said, we have um, data loaded. We have loading jobs created. And by looking at our Graph Studio, we can see that we have these ratings and movies.csv files. So let's go ahead and run this loading job. Here we can see that we point to our data source, which is this CSV file here. Uh, the thing to note is the location of the CSV file. So right here, home, Tiger Graph, Tiger Graph, data, GUI. That is the default location for any files uploaded through Graph Studio. If you're uploading your files through the 
map data to graph page and you're selecting the new file add data file icon and you click this plus icon here to upload a file that is the location that it will end up in if you're creating things through that way or if you're running a loading job with data that was included with the graph such as the one that we're doing then that's where you'll want to point it otherwise if you've added the file yourself then you'll want to point it at the location where you added the file on your tiger graph server so then from there, we're just going to run another gsql command to run our loading job. And the job that we want to run is load movies CSV. We can get that name from up here. Um, it has a unique identifier, which once again, we can see up here. And we'll want to use the data source data source. So this part here is a little bit, um, this might not make sense at first. So I just want to point out what exactly is happening here. If we look at our loading job, create loading job movies, we can see here that we define our file name. File name, this is the variable for the file that we're actually going to be loading. So we have named that variable my data source. So when we run that loading job command, what we are saying is the variable my data source, which is our file, is going to be pointed at data source, which here we defined as the path to our actual file. So you'll just need to take note that when you're running a loading job, you will need to use this using command to tell it what file to use. And in order to use using properly, you will just need to know the variable name of your file name as defined within your loading job. If you're writing your own loading jobs, there's a good chance you'll remember this. You'll have what's down and this will be pretty easy for you. But if you're running pre-made loading jobs, just make sure to print out those jobs just so you know what that variable is um, for those file names. So that way you have it when you go to load in your data. So let's go ahead and load in our data. So we'll just run this and this will run our loading job. We won't see any print from the results until the loading job is finished. So this may take a couple seconds um, to a minute to actually load the data. There we go, went pretty quickly. Uh, so we can see here that we loaded in 27,279 lines at a speed of around 208,000 lines per second. So that took a couple seconds to run. And that is all of our movies loaded in. So now let's just go ahead and load in the last of our data. Um, this file is already on the server, so we're just going to run this loading job for ratings. This is exactly the same as running our movies loading job, same procedure. We need to find our variable here, and we've given out our data source, which is the path to the file on our TigerGraph server itself. Um, this one is a bit bigger, so this might take a little bit longer to run. But in general, TigerGraph is very quick at loading in data. And even though we're loading in over 40 million edges and 138,000 people, this shouldn't take more than a minute. There we go. So we can see that our job has finished. Um, and it took about a minute to load in um, 30 million edges. And what we can do now is just to verify all of this, we can run our uh, get loaded stats function that we've created. Uh, just to get some pretty numbers. So if we scroll up, we can see that we have uh, 138,495 people, 27,000 movies, and a lot of edges. How many is this? Um, 20 million edges. So that is quite a big bit of data. And now let's take a look at how to actually query it so we can extract some useful information. If you haven't created a query before, I highly recommend you check out the documentation on how to create a query. Um, here I'm just going to be covering running queries from within uh, PyTigerGraph, actual uh, query creation, semantics, and um, different rules of queries. Uh, you should look elsewhere for those. Here we'll see that we're going to run another uh, GSQL block. We have our line here to create our query test query for our graph, my graph, which is the graph that we're using. And all this query is going to do is print test query works. So I'll go ahead and create this query. Test query has been added. Now it's important to note here that there are two different ways to run queries within TigerGraph. There are interpreted queries and there are installed queries. The process of installing a query involves the query being optimized and converted into a format which will allow it to more rapidly return results from TigerGraph. 
The only gotcha with this solution is that the installation process can take a minute or two, um, depending on your query. It will run much faster once it's installed, but if that initial installation process will take some time. The alternative is we can run our query in interpreted mode. This does not require that we install the query, but instead lets us run a less performant version of the query immediately. So that's what we're going to do now with our test query. So we can see here that our GSQL block says interpret query test query. So let's run that and see what we get. So here we can see our error is false. There is no error. And we can see that our results are test query works, which is what we had here, print test query works. So that's all set. So now what that was doing was running a saved query. So when we created this query, we saved it on our machine. We did not install it because like I said, that process takes time, but we saved it, which allows us to run it in interpreted mode. Now, if we were to go over to the right query section of TigerGraph, we would see that this query exists on our TigerGraph server as a saved query. Notice the floppy disk icon next to it. And that if we hover over it, we have the install query option. And here we have the run query and interpreted mode option. We do not have the just run query option because it is not installed. It is just saved. Another thing that we can do with interpreted queries is we do not have to save them. If you have a query, a simple query that you just want to run one off, there's no need for you to save that query and then to call it in interpreted mode. You can just call that query in interpreted mode and it will not save that query. So we'll call this one test query two, just so I can show this off a little bit more. But basically what we're going to do now is use PyTigerGraph's run interpreted query uh, function to interpret our query, test query two, uh, for graph my graph, and here we'll just print test query two works. So if we run this, we can see here test query two works. And if we go over to our queries here in our graph, we can see that we have not created a new query for test query two. This was just a one-off run of test query two. So now what we're gonna do is um, install a bit of a more complex query, and we're actually going to install this one and then run it. Um, so I've run this already, so let me just delete this query real quickly. Um, so we'll delete it from here. So our query is defined here. You can go through and read that query if you want, but basically what this query is going to do is take an input person, and it is going to attempt to recommend movies to them based on other people who have rated the same movies that that person has rated and what other movies they like. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, save that query. So right now, remember, we've just created it. We have not installed it. We're not running it. So the query recommend movies has been added. If we go back here, recommend movies exists. So there it is. And now if we head over, we can see we're going to install the query. So this will take a minute or two to run. Like I said, it's going through a process of optimizing the query and uh, making sure that it will run most efficiently on our graph. So we'll run this and we'll come back in about a minute when our query is installed. So there we go, our query has been installed. So now let's take a look at running it. So if you look at the above query, you'll notice that we had three inputs. Um, I've listed those out here. So basically we have our input, pers input person who we're starting with. So here we're using person number 215. So this is our um, vertex ID for our person. We could look them up in our graph if we wanted to. If we go to explore graph, um, we could pull up a vertex type um, person by, come on, I'm so slow, by 215, search. And here we can see this person. And if we double click, then we can expand out some edges of all of the movies that they've rated. Uh, so they've rated quite a few movies, so we've got a lot to work off of here. So now the next thing that we're gonna need to input is our K1 and our K2 parameters. K1 is the number of people who rated the same movies as our input person to consider. So like I said, we're going to take this person, we're going to look at the movies that they've rated. Let me just grab one here, oops. So I'll grab uh, Star Trek First Contact. And if we can expand that out, we can see all these blue dots now are the other people who've rated that movie. So what we're going to do is for each movie that our first person is rated, we're going to look at all of the other people who have rated that movie. And then we're going to look at the movies that they have also rated 
And we're going to see if we can find, based on those movies that those other people have rated highly, if there are any movies that we can then recommend back to our initial person. So the number here, K1, that we're specifying is the number of people to limit it to. So as we expand out this movie here, um, Star Trek First Contact, we can see that there are a bunch of people that have also reviewed it. So we are only going to take this specified number, in this case, 50. So we're only going to grab 50 of these blue dots per movie and use those um, to try and find the similar movies. And then after that, when we've looked at all those similar movies, we are only going to return 10 results, the top 10 most likely movies that our input person will enjoy based on movies that people have enjoyed, who have enjoyed the same movies as our input person. Now, it's kind of a lot to say, complicated to say, but the, the idea behind it is relatively simple. If other people who liked the same movie liked similar movies, then it's most likely that our initial person will like similar movies. Enough talk. Let's run this query and let's see what we get. All right. So here we return a list of movies that we believe our input person will enjoy. Uh, so we can see here each of our movies listed out as well as their unique ID, and then the other information about them. Um, so we can see, uh, based on these, it looks like our person enjoys dramas and comedies seem to be their main um, genres of movies. A little bit of sci-fi in here, uh, but a lot of these are comedies or comedy dramas. So we can see that these, these were the 10 movies that we recommended to our person. Um, and you can go ahead and feel free to change any of these inputs and see what other results that you can return for other individuals or different sample sizes. So feel free to play around with that a little bit and get your hand on kind of how these queries work. Well, queries are extremely useful for flexibly querying um, your data. Sometimes you just want to find paths. And we have some included pathfinding algorithms within TigerGraph that you can quickly access from PyTigerGraph. Um, so basically what pathfinding does is it looks at uh, connections between different nodes and our two different pathfinding algorithms, sort shortest path and all paths, will find either the shortest path between uh, two points on our graph or just return all paths between points on our graph. So we'll start with shortest path. So we'll start from person 215 to person 777. So what this is going to do is attempt to find a path between our two people, 215 and 777, uh, most likely based on similar movies that they've rated. So if they've both rated the same movie, then that will be our shortest path because we'll go from person 215 through that rating to the movie, and then from that movie through our reverse rating edge back to person 777. So that would be our shortest path. So let's see if these two have rated the same movie. And it looks like they have. So here we can see that that case is true, that both of our users did rate the same movie and that that was the fastest path through them. So we can see here that we've returned three vertices. So there's our start, oops, sorry. So here's our start person, here's our end person. And we can also see that we've returned a movie, American Splendor. Now, if we look at our edges, we can see that there are two edges. So we have a reverse rating and a forward rating. So this forward rating will be our traversal from our start point to our movie, American Splendor. And then this reverse rating will be our edge from our movie, American Splendor, to our second person, 777. So here we can see that this is the shortest path. If there are multiple shorter paths, it will only return one, or if there are multiple paths of the same length, only one will be returned. Um, so there may very well be more movies uh, that these two have rated in common. Uh, if we want to look at those edges, uh, multiple paths, then we can go here to our all paths uh, function. So here we can run all paths, and it's good to note here our inputs. So we will want to, again, input that we have a vertex type person and that vertex ID. We want to input that as a tuple. So notice here how that is a tuple um, as an input, and that is the same for our shortest paths. So we input a tuple of vertex type and vertex ID. And we could potentially start at multiple of those. So note how this is an array. We could start from multiple people and find all paths to multiple people. Um, so here we have that same setup. And then also here we have a depth variable. So this is how many layers of paths that we are going to go through. So for example, this is, we go from 
a user to a movie back to a user. So I guess two hops. If we wanted to go more than two hops, say a user to a movie to another user to a movie and then back to a third user, then that would be there would be many more connections returned uh, from there. And in fact, our return size could be massive. So even just with these two traversals here of going out from a user to a movie and then back to another user, we'll see that we return a whole slew of results here. So we could scroll through this for a while, as you can see, big scroll bar here. Um, but you get the idea that those are, so any of these movies that show up here are movies that both user 654 and 856 have graded. Um, so like I said, you can feel free to go through and change up these numbers. If you do change uh, this one, you will get longer query times and a much longer result. You may even run into the case where the Google Colab is unable to parse the JSON result. Let me see, just so I can show you what that error message would look like if you happen to run into it, which we might've done. Yep, there we go. So we can see that we timed out from that one uh, just because we were trying to request too much data. You, there is another timeout that you will get um, related to JSON parsing if uh, you're trying to return too much data within the Google Colab. You won't run into these issues if you're running uh, these scripts locally from a machine, but if you're running them through this notebook, then you may run into errors when returning large JSON. The last major thing I want to cover here is the ability to integrate with Pandas data frames. So PyTiger Graph can both upsert and pull out data from your graph in Pandas data frames format. So I'm just going to walk through quickly how to do that. So the first thing that we'll want to look at here is getting data as a data frame. So here we'll create data frame one, and that data frame will contain all vertex data from all vertices of the type movie. So we're basically going to create a data frame with all of our movies in it. Data frame two is going to only contain specific vertices. So here we'll see get vertex by for get vertex data frame by ID. This function is just like our get vertex by ID function. So we see that we're specifying that it is a movie type vertex. And we're actually going to get two vertices here, movie 44 and movie ID 56. Um, and we'll see those in a second. And then next, we're going to convert a vertex set to a data frame. So if you retrieve vertices via another method and you want those as a pandas data frame, then this function will allow you to convert the results that you already have into a data frame. So here we're going to select a vertices by ID. Note that this isn't um, get vertex data frame by ID. This is just get, get vertices. So we're going to get person number five, and then we are going to convert that vertex set into a data frame and print out that data frame. So let's see what we get for results here. Data frame one is going to be all of our movies, and it looks like that is all of our movies. There's 27,278 movies, and our data frame contains that many results. So now our specific movies data frame. So if you remember, we selected movie 44 and movie 56, and here we can see movies 44 and 56 um, selected and represented as our pandas data frame as well. And now lastly, let's take a look at our JSON vertex set, which is returned by our get vertices by ID. And then once we convert that to a pandas data frame, we can see our data frame just contains our unique vertex ID of five because there are no attributes for this vertex. Um, so that's basically how to convert vertices to data frames. Now let's take a look at edges. Um, so this would be a very similar story. Get edges data frame is just like get vertices, except we specify a starting point. So we're starting at a vertex type person with the unique ID of 50. And we are going to limit this to only three edges coming from that vertex with the ID of 50. Next, we're going to take a look at converting a JSON set of edges into a data frame set, just like we did with our vertices. So let's just take a look at what we get here. First, we get our data frame, and that returns our edge data frame. We limited it to three because we have that limit option available to really any of our get edges or vertices functions. So we can see that these are all coming from person 50 as we specified. And these are our movies and their IDs, as well as the rating and date and time that they were rated at. Um, so this is just all of our edge attribute information for those three edges that we've selected for person 50. And they're represented in pandas uh, data frame format. Next, here we can see the JSON print of selecting those edges as well. So this is our, our standard get edges, not get edges as data frame. 
and we can see here that JSON representation. And then once again, if we take that and we convert that JSON representation into a data frame, once again, here we have another data frame containing that edge information. The last thing we'll look at are just some bits of code that I've included in this notebook that are just helpful for whatever you may be doing with PyTiger Graph. So up here, this block is just kind of your, if you're coming back to this notebook, if you're using the notebook, you step away for a little bit, says your runtime's been disconnected, would you like to reconnect? You'll need to reestablish your connection to your Tiger Graph server. This block of code right here will do that. This is basically just contains all of your um, connection parameters. You will have to edit these for your graph. And then um, it just goes through retrieving your token and connecting to your graph and using your graph. You'll have to change that from graph name to uh, something else if you're using something other than my graph. Get loaded stats, that's the exact same as the function that we had before. Now let's take a look at token management. Tokens, we created one initially to connect and we will need it in order to execute our queries. So we can create a new token, as was shown at the beginning with the create token, you'll need a secret in order to create a token. Uh, we can also refresh our token uh, with the secret, which will change our token. You can specify an optional lifetime here. Uh, so I've set this one for 30 days. I believe that that is also the default. And additionally, you can delete a token uh, just by using your secret. That is kind of how you manage your tokens. Should you accidentally publicly post one to a Google Colab like I have uh, going through there, I'm going to delete that token when I'm done recording this video so no one else can connect to my graph. Lastly, uh, we have some more additional commands here. So here is echo. Um, this just allows you to quickly know if you're actually connected to your server. So hello GSQL, we are connected. Get endpoints. Get endpoints will list off all of the endpoints of our graph. Most interactions with the graph are done via REST endpoints. So really behind the scenes, a lot of these PyTiger graph functions that we've been running have just either been hitting REST endpoints on the server or running blocks of GSQL. So here we can see uh, we have an endpoint for any query that we created. So here's the one for test query. We could make a REST request to uh, this location and we would retrieve the results of our test query. Same with our recommended movies. And if you scroll through here, you can see all of the different parameters of the graph that are returnable via uh, the REST API. Uh, so really most of this is our schema. Uh, we can get information about specific vertices or edges from here. And uh, some of these are also our um, paths queries, our shortest paths queries, and a whole bunch of other things like that as well. Feel free to take a look through this list on your own server to kind of see what's available to you. Uh, via REST endpoints, but anything that is available via those REST points is also available through PyTiger Graph. So there's really a lot of different options for how you want to connect and interact with your Tiger Graph solution. Get installed queries is the same as when we were running show queries before. This will only list installed queries. This will not list saved queries, and this will not list those one-off queries that you've interpreted, like I showed in the interpreting queries section. This will only list queries that are fully installed on your Tiger Graph solution. So here we can see our recommended movies and our test query. Get statistics, we'll return some statistics if we've run any queries. It's been a little while, it looks like, since I've run some queries. So let's see if we increase this a little bit, if we can get some data. So here we go. So here's a little bit of data on our latency uh, from our queries and our performance metrics. If I had run more queries, these numbers would be a lot more meaningful. But because I've really only run each of these queries once, um, there aren't any meaningful numbers here. So these are really only useful once you've been using, using your server a bit and you're looking to investigate query performance and maybe see if there are any areas where you can optimize your queries in order to gain some more performance out of them. Get ver and get version. Get version will list off the version of every single component of your Tiger Graph solution, while get ver will allow you to specify which component you would actually like to receive the version information for. So we can see a list of everything returned by get version. And if we specify that we only want our GPE version, then we can see that that is returned as 3.1.1, which is, which is our GPE version, 3.1.1. So next up, we have user-defined data types. Our current graph does not have any user-defined data types. However, if your graph did, then those would show up here. You can both list all UDTs or you can get a specific UDT by its UDT name. Since we don't have any in our graph, regardless of what we do, those are both going to be blank. And lastly here, we have our secret management. 
So this is how we create new secrets, as well as how we show any secrets that we've created in the past. So if we run this, um, we can see that I go to create a t secret test secret, and there's that secret printed because I chose to print it. But otherwise, should you only be looking at your secrets? So if you are only showing secrets that you have already created in the past, then you will not be able to see the actual secret itself. However, you can see any tokens that have been created using that secret. So yeah, that's all of the functionality of Python Tiger Graph. Um, feel free to check out the documentation if you're looking for any more specifics on any of the commands. But this uh, Colab notebook should really be everything you need to get started with using PyTigerGraph for interfacing with your TigerGraph solution. So I hope you enjoyed. And make sure to check out our developer site or submit any questions that you might have involving the solution or anything involving TigerGraph on our developer Discord channel or through our community forums, both of which will be linked in the video description.